How's it going guys? So basic hard failure points, not going to be a lengthy clip, let's just hop through. All right, so we'll start with left hard failure. What I'm not going to do is first day of med school where we walk you through what the heart and the lungs look like. You have to know some basic stuff, okay? So if the left heart fails, we are going to back up to the lungs. So as a result, we get pulmonary findings. Dyspnea, just trouble breathing. Orthopnea means the patient has to sleep propped up on pillows. And paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea means the patient wakes up in the middle of the night gasping for air. So the reason the patient would sleep propped up on pillows in the setting of left heart failure is because when you lie down, when you're supine, there's increased venous return. So you're going to have more volume ultimately that makes it from the right heart to the left heart. And the left heart simply decompensates. It can't handle that increase in volume when the patient's supine. So that's going to back up to the lungs. So pulmonary edema as a result, which is going to fill the alveolar spaces, cause dyspnea. And that can happen in the middle of the night in a panic form, and that's your PND. So as I just said, it's going to back up to the lungs, any type of left heart problem. And USMLE wants you to know this very buzzy phrase, increased pulmonary capillary hydrostatic pressure. This will be an answer on quite a few NBME questions. So for example, they could just, any left heart pathology, okay? They could say patient has stomach hypertension with left ventricular hypertrophy. They can give you aortic stenosis. They can give you mitral stenosis. Doesn't matter. Any left heart pathology, if the patient has dyspnea and they say, what's the mechanism for the patient's dyspnea? The answer can just simply be increased pulmonary capillary hydrostatic pressure. It's past level. It's very basic, okay? So and I wrote also, uh, this can lead to pleural effusion, which can sound a little bit weird. Patient, uh, patient, the student says, does that occur on the left or right side? Which lung? It doesn't matter, okay? So when you get a backup from the left heart to the lungs, you get bilateral crackles, bilateral pulmonary edema. This is transidate, so increased pulmonary capillary hydrostatic pressure. We have transidate, not exudate. Transidate being the fluid is relatively devoid of white cells, LDH, and protein. It's more like... Uh, saline essentially. And not only can you get bilateral pulmonary edema, but you can get a pleural effusion on the left or right. So just know that that's possible. Okay, so left atrial pressure equals pulmonary capillary wedge pressure. You have to know that. You have to memorize that. We could do a lengthy 70 minute discussion on every talking point here. But the long story short is if you insert a catheter through the veins up to the right heart and you enter the right atrium, right ventricle, pulmonary artery and you continue sticking that catheter distally until it's in a pulmonary arteriole and then theoretically a pulmonary capillary and it can't go any further, the pressure reverberations that the tip of that catheter senses come from the left atrium because all the blood in the heart and the vasculature in the heart is ultimately going to go to the left atrium. So if you have any type of left heart pathology where we have a backup to the left atrium, so left, so if you have left ventricular uh, problems, systemic hypertension, aortic stenosis, doesn't matter, any type of left atrial dilatation as a result, increased pressure in the left atrium backs up to the lungs, okay? And so they want you to know that the pressure sensed by that tip of the uh, catheter in the distal pulmonary capillary is the same as the left atrial pressure. Now, the relevance for you assimilate is that they can give you a 15 line rambling paragraph of a question and the last line they'll just say pulmonary capillary wedge pressure is increased they might say normal range is 5 to 14 millimeters of mercury then they give you 16 and that just means you have a left heart problem so for example they can just say patient has low blood pressure here's your 15 line paragraph pcwp is increased students reading for 12 minutes about like what's going on waste of fucking time you look at the answers and you'll just see answers like hypovolemia, septic shock, there's silent MI as an answer. And you're just going to choose the only answer there that's cardiogenic would be the silent MI in theory, okay? And plenty of questions revolve around PCWP. So it's a pass level detail and students often don't realize how important that is. And then conversely, if your PCWP is normal, you know that you don't have left heart pathology, okay? So... I'll talk about how this relates to core pulmonale as we move through uh, this PowerPoint here. But if you were to have, let's say, just let's give an example, a patient who has history of systemic hypertension and is alcoholic and gets pancreatitis and then gets bilateral crackles in the lungs, and dyspnea, 
and they say the PCWP is normal, we could say that that's ARDS, acute respiratory distress syndrome. And you say, well, the patient has systemic hypertension, could be left heart failure, couldn't it, causing pulmonary edema? Well, your PCWP is not elevated. So you know that they're, they're telling you it's not, card it's not left heart, it's not cardiogenic in origin, the problem with the lungs, okay? That would be pancreatitis is a very buzzy cause of ARDS as an example. Okay, so once again, just reiterating the very buzzy point, increased pulmonary pillory, hydrostatic pressure. They really love that. There's another answer floating around uh, on one of the two CK forms, actually, but it doesn't matter because it's still a step one-esque uh, question where they just want you to know increased uh, AA gradient is the answer for why you have dyspnea. Okay, so that's also a lengthy, annoying discussion. But if you have low oxygen in your arteries slash arterioles, we look at the AA gradient because if you're able to breathe in oxygen just fine, your alveoli are going to have normal slash high oxygen, right? So the difference between your, uh, your alveolar and your arterial oxygen is going to be very high if there's some sort of impediment of gas exchange occurring. So your alveoli, good oxygen, your arterioles, shitty oxygen. Well, the only way that makes sense, the only way to have that large AA gradient is if there's something impeding gas exchange, such as pulmonary edema. Okay, obviously it could be things like fibrosis separately, but if you have fluid there, transidate from the pulmonary edema, that's a high AA gradient. There's going to be, there's no such thing as a low AA gradient, but it's either going to be high or just not high. Okay, same thing for PCWP. PCWP is high, that's cardio, that's left heart problem, and then it can just be like normal or low. Okay, so the same thing for the AA gradient. The only thing you need to know for your simile where, where you have a normal AA gradient is going to be when you have hypoventilation, and that'll be barbiturates, benzodiazepines, opioids. Patient might be on a ventilator where the ventilation is not sufficient, and they'll just tell you that the A gradient's normal, okay? And that's what you need to know. Patients on opioids, in which the following most likely be seen as patient, they have high A gradient listed as an answer. It's fucking wrong because patient would have, would have a normal A gradient. If you're hypoventilating, your alveolar oxygen is obviously low. So you've got low oxygen in the arterioles, low oxygen in the alveoli, so the difference is not high, okay? Let's move to right heart failure. So this presents the systemic findings, jugular venous distension, peripheral, peripheral edema. So the same way the left heart backs up to the lungs, the right heart backs up to the body, okay? So your jugular vein, three centimeters above the costal margin is normal. I've seen them write this on NBMEs. They'll say, Jugular venous pulsations are three centimeters above the sternal angle. And the student's like, oh, that's increased. It's not. That's normal. Okay. So uh, so three centimeters above is normal. Jugular venous distension would mean you have impaired right heart filling. So often just means right heart failure. It could occasionally be things like cardiac tamponade, right? So uh, it's not that you have right heart failure. It's just the you, you have an acute scenario where uh, blood can't enter the right heart. So peripheral edema because... If you have impaired venous return to the right heart, then you have increased venous hydrostatic pressure. So with left heart failure, we had increased pulmonary capillary hydrostatic pressure. With right heart failure, we have increased central venous pressure. And ultimately, that's going to make its way down to the veins and the legs. Increased venous hydrostatic pressure with transidation into the interstitium within the legs. So as I just fucking said, uh, you're going to have increased hydrostatic pressure in the veins neck veins, etc. Okay, so I'm just pointing out that hepatosplenomegaly is technically a right heart failure finding, but it's not really seen on USMLA. They can give you like maybe one out of eight uh, heart failure questions where they say the, the liver edge is palpable. Okay, I mean, it's pretty rare though, but, but there is something technically called nutmeg liver where you have chronic congestion within the liver due to right heart failure. But uh, I'd say for the overwhelming majority of right heart failure scenarios, you know, you just need to know JVD and peripheral edema. Okay. And as I just said before, the three centimeters uh, for JVP is normal. Now, this is like very interesting when I write congestive heart failure equals left heart failure plus right heart failure, because if I were to ask many of you watching this, uh, what is congestive heart failure prior to seeing this here? You would give me a, a whole myriad of meandering explanations. All you need to know is that the most common cause of right heart failure is left heart failure. Okay, so the left heart's going to fail. It's going to back up to the lungs. Well, the lungs are going to back up to the right heart. 
and then the right heart backs up to the body. So if you get a combination of left heart failure findings, pulmonary findings, with systemic findings, JVD, peripheral edema, we now call that congestive heart failure. So sometimes I'll get a question, I'll do an NBME question with a student where they might just say that there's uh, crackles in the lungs, okay, so there's left heart failure, and I'm like, what's the diagnosis here? And they're like, oh, like congestive heart failure. I'm like, are there right heart failure findings here? And they're like, mm, no. And I'm like, well, it's not congestive heart failure. It's just left heart failure. So as I just said, left heart failure is the most common cause of right heart failure. Okay, so we're going to have a mix of the two. Okay, so once again, we're just integrating PCWP. So pulmonary capillary wedge pressure is obviously elevated in congestive heart failure since the left heart is involved. Now, core pulmonale, uh, this is an important diagnosis clearly for you, Simile. It's right heart failure due to a pulmonary cause, and your left heart is completely normal. So therefore, your pulmonary capillary wedge pressure is normal. You must have a normal pulmonary capillary wedge pressure to diagnose core pulmonale. Okay, so where it can get a little bit confusing is they can give you a long paragraph where they say dude has hypertension, he's got a hundred pack year history of smoking, and he's got some pulmonary findings, some wheezes, and you say, well, how do we know that if they don't mention PCWP, as, for, for instance, how do we know that there's not also left heart failure ca like causing pulmonary edema? How do we know it's just the smoking? You got to use your fucking head, okay? I mean, if they give you uh, a paragraph of a question that's overwhelmingly focused on the patient's lung disease, and the patient just happens to have maybe hypertension as well. I mean, you say, sure, it's possible to have left heart failure as causing the pulmonary findings, but they're focusing here on the on strictly the, the lungs as the etiology. So uh, core pulmonary right heart failure due to a pulmonary cause, okay? So they'll give you JVD and or peripheral edema in someone who's a heavy smoker, cystic fibrosis, okay, over lung disease. Boot shaped heart is often used to describe isolated right heart failure. Okay, sometimes it's used for tetralogy of Fallot, unrelated, but it's just a boot shaped heart they can say reflects right ventricular hypertrophy. Now, something to note is that if you have left heart failure and they can mention an, an enlarged cardiac silhouette or a lateralized apex beat where the left ventricle is enlarged, so it's going to move to the left uh, side of the chest, so the right of the chest x ray when you're looking at it. And in contrast, if a patient has hyperinflated lungs due to COPD, rather than having a lateralized apex beat, you're going to have the heart push toward the midline. Okay, so you get a cardiac silhouette that's narrow and vertical, called a vertical heart, or a long, narrow cardiac silhouette. So there's a question, as I just talked about, so the 100 pack your history of smoking, hypertension, and they give you a, a long, narrow cardiac silhouette, they describe it in the sub xiphoid space, well, that's clearly core pulmonale, okay, so COPD causing the heart to be pushed to the midline, you get findings of right heart failure, JVD, peripheral edema, that's clearly core pulmonale. Okay, so pulmonary hypertension, I'm just reiterating that um, the reason you get right heart failure due to a pulmonary cause is because if you have problems within the lungs, that ultimately is going to impede blood flow through the lungs. There's many mechanisms, okay? If we were to, let's say, look at COPD, when you have emphysema, so COPD is emphysema plus chronic bronchitis. If you have emphysema, you have loss of alveolar surface area, you have loss of the pulmonary capillaries within that surface area. So it's like knocking out components of a parallel circuit, uh, which means that your overall resistance increases, increase afterload on the right heart, causes right heart failure. If you have uh, chronic bronchitis, you're going to have um, increased uh, bronchial mucus production, and that's going to cause hypoxic vasoconstriction, leading to increased afterload. Pulmonary hypertension, okay, you get a backup to the right heart. And then, of course, some of you are very aware that endothelin 1, very buzzy, it's a vasoconstrictor, and bosentin is an endothelin 1 receptor antagonist. Both, uh, endothelin 1 is not limited to the lungs, by the way. Okay, so there is actually one NBME question floating around where they say, like, random dude uh, shaving and cuts his neck. And they say, which the following is most likely to be seen? And the answer is increased endothelin 1 expression at the site of injury. And it's, like, weird because you're like, oh, I thought that was, like, pulmonary. So you can just be aware that, like, 14 out of 15 questions, like, endothelin 1 is described for pulmonary, but it is technically... Uh, 
elsewhere. And endothelin one's also increased in left heart failure. I'm not sure if I wrote that here. So, but I, I didn't, but no, I did. Yeah. So left heart failure, if, uh, if that's going to back up to the lungs causing pulmonary edema, you're also going to have increased endothelin one. Okay. So you're going to have uh, the pulmonary vessels constricting to limit that backflow from the left heart. And then this is like a little bit uh, tricky. What they can do is give you pulmonary hypertension slash core pulmonale and say, which the following is going to be decreased in this patient. And they'll uh, have endothelin as an answer and it's wrong. And the student um, chooses it. And it's like, because they're used to seeing endothelin as a very buzzy word for pulmonary hypertension, but it's increased, not decreased in pulmonary hypertension, right? So it makes sense that nitric oxide, which is a dilator, would be decreased in pulmonary hypertension slash core pulmonale. Okay, and then this is one of the most important details for you assimile, and you watching this clip right now don't realize how high yield this is. Because if I didn't mention it, you probably wouldn't even notice these findings and questions, and now that I have, you'll start to see it. A loud P2, they can describe that as a loud pulmonic component of S2, or they can just say loud S2, which is A2 and P2, okay, the aortic and the pulmonic valves closing. But if they just say loud S2, four out of five times, they're just talking about a loud P2, okay? So the pulmonic valve is going to slam shut if we have pulmonary hypertension, okay? So uh, I write, discuss these in the tables below. Well, I decided not to put the fucking tables in here, so we'll, we'll not worry about that for the moment. But a loud P2, uh, you are going to have the pulmonic valve slam shut if there's increased distal pressure. Okay, it's a long discussion, uh, but when you have systole ejection from the right ventricle, the way that that valve opens, the pulmonic valve opens in the first place, is because the pressure within the chamber of the right ventricle exceeds that of the pulmonary artery. Well, as the blood is ejected, the pressure within the right ventricle is going to fall below the pressure in the pulmonary artery and the pulmonic valve is going to close. Well, if you have high pulmonary arterial pressure, it's going to be easier for that gradient. So it's going to be easier, quicker for the right ventricular luminal pressure to fall below the pulmonary arterial pressure. So we get a slamming shut of the pulmonic valve. Okay. So they can say a loud P2 and then tricuspid regurge. Very interesting finding. It's the highest, the highest yield cause of tricuspid regurge on US simile is pulmonary hypertension slash core pulmonale. Okay. You say, well, what about pulmonic regurge? No fucking idea. Okay. But it's, it doesn't show up in questions for uh, pulmonary hypertension slash core pulmonale. It's tricuspid regurge for whatever reason. So they'll describe it as a holosystolic murmur that increases with inspiration, tricuspid regurge. They can give you one, uh, one of the findings. So some questions you might just see loud pulmonic component of S2. You're like, oh, that's pulmonary hypertension. Or they don't mention a loud P2. They just say uh, heart sounds are normal. And they say there's a whole systolic murmur that increases with inspiration. That's tricuspid regurgitation. All right. So obviously you can just hop to the other clips here. And that's your basic heart failure and core pulmonale clip for the moment. That's it.